Hello and welcome to the module Nanoparticle Health Effects. My name is Gurumurthy Ramachandran and I'm a faculty member at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences. By the end of this module, learners should be able to do the following. Predict the role of particle properties on health effects. Describe the kinds of health studies that have been conducted related to nanoparticle exposures. Identify potential health effects from inhalation and dermal exposures to nanomaterials. And recognize uncertainties in health studies as they apply to human health risks. It is important to understand the significance of the nanoscale in terms of the effects it has on the properties of materials. The nanoscale is defined as the size of particles from 100 nanometers to the size of atoms, or roughly 0.2 nanometers. At this scale, the properties of materials can be very different from those at larger scales. As the size of particles decreases, two important factors come into play. First, there is an increased relative surface area. That is, the amount of surface area of the particle exposed to the environment per unit mass of the particle. This means that more of the atoms comprising the particle are on the surface of the particle. For example, a 30 nanometer particle has 5% of its atoms on the surface, while a 10 nanometer particle has 20% of its atoms on its surface, and a 3 nanometer particle has 50% of its atoms on its surface. Secondly, at the nanoscale, quantum effects become more obvious and dominate as size becomes small. As a result, some physical and chemical properties change dramatically. This next series of slides illustrates the relationship between mass, number, and surface area of particles. Imagine a cubical particle with a length of one unit. It has a certain mass that depends on its density, and its surface area is the area of its six faces, that is, six units of area. Now we have divided this particle into eight smaller particles so that the mass of the smaller particles is still the same as that of the one original particle. But now the surface area of these eight particles is 12 units. Thus, the number of particles has gone up by a factor of eight and the surface area has gone up by a factor of two. If we now repeat this process one more time, we will again increase the so number of particles by a factor of eight leading to 64 particles and the surface area by another factor of 2 or a total surface area of 24 units. Once more of the same and now the number of particles is 512 and the surface area is again doubled to 48. One more time and now the number of particles is 4096 and the surface area is again doubled to 96. The same novel properties that make nanoparticles attractive in new material synthesis, for example, high reactivity and ability to cross cell membranes, also could lead to adverse health effects. Nanoparticles are characterized by special physical and chemical properties. The first property is their size. Smaller particles in this size range are more reactive than larger particles of the same material, maybe due to higher surface area per unit mass. The second property is their chemical composition. For example, transition metals on surfaces of nanoparticles. Many urban air pollution studies have suggested that transition metals may be one of the causative agents of the health effects of being exposed to fine particles in urban smog. Transition metals are key ingredients used in the synthesis of many nanomaterials. Could this be a concern for health effects due to exposure to nanoparticles? The third property is their morphology or shape. We know from our experience with larger size particles that sometimes the shape of particles has an effect on human health. For example, part of the toxicity of asbestos fibers comes from their fiber-like or cylindrical shape. Some commonly used nanoparticles, such as carbon nanotubes, have a similar shape. Should this be a cause for concern? Finally, the small sizes of nanoparticles also cause a greater degree of translocation 
within the body. Let us briefly review our generic definition of exposure that we have encountered in a previous module. Exposure is defined as the intensity or the concentration of a contaminant at an appropriate interface between the environment and the individual over a specific time interval that has biological relevance. For example, an adverse health outcome. This definition is applicable to both inhalation and dermal exposures that are relevant in the case of human exposures to nanomaterials. In this module, we will first discuss the inhalation exposure route and then the dermal route with their relevant health effects. We will first study the effects of inhalation on health and we will discuss the following topics. Particle characteristics affecting respiratory tract deposition and uptake, chemical and physical particle clearance mechanisms, translocation mechanisms, and health effects of exposures to nanoparticles. In the following slides, we will see that the following factors are important particle characteristics that affect lung deposition and uptake. Particle size, particle shape, particle composition, solubility, particle surface reactivity, and charge characteristics. It is important that we understand the human respiratory tract from the perspective of particle deposition during inhalation. While the human respiratory tract is a complex structure, we can use a very rudimentary physiological picture of it for the discussion of how inhaled airborne substances behave inside the respiratory tract. It provides the basis for talking about the fluid mechanics which governs how airborne particles are conveyed into the lung and how they might in turn be deposited there. Outside air is drawn in through the nose and or the mouth during breathing. It flows fast through the nasal and mouth passages, also known as the nasopharyngeal or the extrathoracic region. And the air is very turbulent in these regions. It includes the airways of the nose, the mouth, and the throat, which together are called the nasopharynx, where the air becomes humidified after entry. The nasal passages are referred to as turbinates and provide a winding and twisting path for the entering air. It then passes through the larynx or the voice box, whereupon it enters the lung itself, that is the thoracic region. The tracheobronchial region is the upper part of the thoracic region, often referred to as the conducting airways, whose purpose is to transmit the air into the deep lung. The air moves relatively quickly through these airways. The air first moves into the trachea or windpipe. The trachea then branches repeatedly into a series of airways referred to as bronchi and then the bronchioles. This region is called the tracheobronchial region. The air moves slower the deeper it gets and finally arrives almost stationary by this time at the alveolar region where the gas exchange takes place. This is the region where oxygen diffuses into the alveolar wall and enters the blood and where carbon dioxide leaves the blood and enters the air that will subsequently be exhaled. This table shows some of the dimensions of various regions of the respiratory tract. The trachea is referred to as generation zero. This divides into two bronchi in generation one. Each airway in one generation gives rise to two branches in the next generation. Generations one through 11 are called bronchi, while the rest up to generation 16 are called bronchioles and terminating bronchioles. The airways in the generation 0 through 16 are together referred to as the tracheobronchial region of the lung. We go from one airway, the trachea, to 2 to the power 11 bronchi in the 11th generation. From generation 16 to 23 are the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, alveolar sacs, and the alveoli. In the 23rd generation, there are 2 to the power 23 or roughly 8 million alveolar sacs that terminate in 300 million alveoli. This region is called the alveolar region of the lung. 
Thus, the thoracic region comprises the tracheobronchial and the alveolar regions. The table also provides the number and dimensions of the airways in each generation and the average air velocity in those generations for a steady inhalation rate of one liter per second. While regular breathing is not steady, but with cyclical changes in direction, these calculations are useful approximations. We can see that while the size of individual ducts decreases with the generation number, there is also an increase in the number of air ducts in each generation. This results in a tremendous increase in the total cross-sectional area of the ducts in each generation. We see that the air velocity is several meters per second in the trachea and the first few generations. Flow is turbulent in this region. The velocity falls rapidly thereafter due to the increase in the total cross-sectional area due to the large number of small ducts. The Reynolds number is sufficiently reduced so that the flow is laminar in this region. In the alveolar sacs, the velocity drops to one millimeter per second and the residence time is roughly 550 milliseconds. This is the region occupied by the reserve air. Molecular and convective diffusion between the tidal air and the reserve air leads to transport of gases into the alveolar region. The individual alveoli are spherical closed-ended structures roughly 300 micrometers in diameter. The 300 million alveoli thus provide a surface area of roughly 75 square meters for gas exchange. This graph shows the fractional deposition of inhaled particles. For larger micrometer sized particles, inertial impaction, gravitational settling, and interception are important mechanisms of deposition in various regions of the respiratory tract. However, the main mechanism for deposition of inhaled nanoparticles in the respiratory tract is diffusion, and mechanisms such as inertial impaction, gravitational settling, and interception do not contribute much. We see from the graph that 80% of the inhaled 1 nanometer or 0.001 micrometer particles are deposited in the nasopharyngeal compartment and around 20% in the tracheobronchial compartment and almost none in the alveolar region. 5 nanometer or 0.005 micrometer particles show about equal deposition of roughly 30% in all three regions. 20 nanometer or 0.02 micrometer particles have the highest deposition efficiency in the alveolar region of roughly 50%, whereas in the tracheobronchial and nasopharyngeal regions, this particle size deposits with approximately 15% efficiency. These different deposition efficiencies should have consequences for potential effects induced by inhaled nanoparticles of different sizes, as well as for their disposition to extrapulmonary organs. The respiratory tract is, of course, not a passive receptacle for particles. There are mechanisms that the human body has for clearing these particles. The clearance of deposited particles can occur by chemical clearance processes and physical translocation of particles. We will next study these processes, starting with chemical clearance. Chemical clearance is related to particles that are lipid soluble or soluble in intracellular and extracellular fluids. They undergo absorption and diffusion or binding to proteins and other subcellular structures. They are then cleared into blood and lymphatic circulation. It can occur in any of the three regions, although to different degrees, depending on local extracellular and intracellular conditions, such as the pH. Physical clearance can occur through several routes and mechanisms. It can occur through the mucociliary escalator, by means of macrophage phagocytosis, through epithelial translocation, through blood circulation, 
and through sensory neurons. Let us first look at the mucociliary escalator. The figure on the bottom right shows that the upper airways are lined with a layer of hair-like projections called cilia that beat rhythmically. The figure on the top left shows a cross-section of the tissue in the respiratory tract. We can see the cilia above the epithelium. The tips of the cilia catch in a gel layer above it. Any particles deposited in the gel layer are thus moved up to the mouth and throat to be removed. The movement of the deposited particles towards the mouth along the ciliary layer gives rise to the term escalator. This mechanism is important for removal of larger particles, but not smaller nanoparticles. A second mechanism is called macrophage phagocytosis. This is a mechanism for removing particles deposited in the alveoli. The figure on the right shows an alveolus. An immune response is triggered by a particle deposited in the alveolar sac. This response recruits a polymorphonuclear neutrophil, PMN, from a blood capillary adjacent to the alveolus. The neutrophil differentiates to become a macrophage that engulfs the particle and transports it out of the alveolus, and this process is called phagocytosis. The efficiency of this clearance mechanism depends highly on the efficiency of alveolar macrophages to sense deposited particles, move to the site of their deposition, and then phagocytose them. There are significant particle size dependent differences in the cascade of events leading to effective alveolar macrophage mediated clearance. This figure displays results of several studies in which rats were exposed to different sized nanoparticles. 24 hours later, the lungs of these animals were lavaged or washed repeatedly, retrieving about 80% of the total macrophages. As shown in figure A, approximately 80% of the 0 0.5, 3, and 10 micrometer particles could be retrieved with the macrophages, whereas only approximately 20% of the nano-sized 15 to 20 and 80 nanometer particles could be lavaged with the macrophages. This figure displays results of several studies in which rats were exposed to different sized particles. Figure B shows that approximately 80% of the nano sized particles were retained in the lavaged lung after exhaustive lavage, whereas approximately 20% of the larger particles, greater than 0 0.5 micrometers, remained in the lavaged lung. This indicates that nanoparticles either were in the epithelial cells or had further translocated to the interstitium. Such interstitial translocation represents a shift in target site away from the alveolar space to the interstitium, potentially causing direct particle-induced effects there. This figure shows results from a rat study where rat lungs were instilled with 500 micrograms of titanium dioxide particles and their interstitium was observed 24 hours after installation. The figure shows the percentage of titanium dioxide that has translocated to the interstitium as a function of particle size. This clearly shows that nanoparticles have much higher degree of translocation to the interstitium and that translocation is very size dependent. Uptake of particles from pulmonary interstitial sites into the circulatory and lymphatic system can take place. Nanoparticles are more effectively and efficiently translocated by this mechanism than larger particles. Several studies have documented the rapid translocation of alveolar deposited nanoparticles into the circulatory system. Lemar et al. reported in experiments with hamsters that 30% of deposited 20 nanometer particles translocated to the blood in five minutes. Radioactively labeled ultrafine carbon particles were found in the blood of human subjects after one minute, 
which was also reported by Namar et al. a year later. Oberdurster et al. reported that a high proportion of carbon particles deposited in rat lungs were found in the liver after about 24 hours. The table in this slide reports on a wide range of studies on translocation of different kinds of nanoparticles from the alveoli to blood capillaries. The studies include particle size from 5 to 400 nanometers, different primary nanoparticles with different surface modifications. Collectively, these studies indicate that particle size and surface chemistry, that is their coating, and possibly charge govern translocation across epithelial and endothelial cell layers. Such target specificity may be extremely valuable for drug delivery. For example, drug delivery to the central nervous system via blood-borne nanoparticles requires surface modifications to these nanoparticles in order to facilitate translocation across the tight blood-brain barrier via specific receptors. This slide shows a newly discovered method for particle translocation that appears to be unique to nanoparticles. Nanoparticles can be translocated from the nasal region through the olfactory nerve and olfactory bulb into the central nervous system. The close proximity of nasal olfactory mucosa and olfactory bulb requires only a short distance to be covered by neuronal transport. This slide shows a table presenting several studies of neuronal transport dating from the 1940s till today. In all these studies, the particles being translocated are nano-sized, although they include the poliovirus particles, silver-coated gold nanoparticles, rhodamine-labeled microspheres, and carbon-13 nanoparticles. The mechanisms of exposure include intranasal and intratracheal installation, as well as whole body inhalation. Finally, this graph shows the time course of carbon-13 tissue concentrations in the lung, olfactory bulb, cerebellum, and cerebrum of rats following a six-hour inhalation exposure to carbon-13 nanoparticles. We can see that there is a noticeable concentration of carbon-13 particles even after one day, and this persists for at least seven days which was the duration of the experiment. To summarize, nanoparticles can be transported by the mucociliary escalator, can be transported by alveolar macrophages, can be transported to the pulmonary interstitium, they can be transported into the circulatory system, and once nanoparticles have translocated to the blood circulation, they can be distributed throughout the body. And finally, nanoparticles can be transported into the central nervous system. After having reviewed the mechanisms of lung deposition and translocation, let us now consider the health effects of exposure to nanoparticles. Unfortunately, there is an absence of epidemiological data for workers exposed to engineered nanoparticles. Much of the current focus in risk assessment involves toxicology studies in animals to assess the hazard determine dose response and time course relationships, and identify modes of action. Due to this, our understanding of the health effects of nanoparticles is necessarily limited. The hazard assessment seeks to identify the nature of any hazardous effects and the evidence regarding the biological mode of action. One of the first epidemiological studies was about the effects of ultrafine particles on lung function by Peters et al. in 1997. The investigators measured peak expiratory flow for adults with a history of asthma in Germany, compared these health effects to data on particle levels, and their evaluation of the effects on lung function considered particle number versus mass, considered particle size intervals, and considered time lag. The graph on the right shows some of their results. If you look at the effects due to the number of particles between 0.01 and 2.5 micrometers, 
versus the mass of particles in the same size range. It is clear that the number of particles has a stronger effect. Number concentration might be important because the number of sites affected may be related to the health effects. A second epidemiological study was by Maynard and Maynard, who reanalyzed data from a previous study done by Schwartz and Marcus on mortality during excessive particle events in London from 1958 to 1972. The authors estimated surface area concentrations from mass concentrations and typical atmospheric aerosol behavior. This graph shows the relationship between excess daily mortality and the concentration of black smoke in micrograms per cubic meter, which, which is the mass-based exposure metric. As we can see, there is a linear relationship only till 150 micrograms per cubic meter exposure. For exposures above this, a nonlinear relationship is observed. This graph shows the same data, but now plotted with exposure metric changed to the aerosol surface area concentration. That is the surface area of the aerosol particles in the black smoke per unit volume of air. A more convincing linear relationship is now seen with this metric. This led Maynard and Maynard to hypothesize that the surface area concentration may be a better metric of exposure for aerosols comprising fine and ultrafine particles. Both these epidemiological studies are suggestive that small particles may have greater toxicity and that surface area may be a relevant exposure metric, but they have some limitations. The Peters et al. study looks at wide ranges of particle size in one size bin from 0 0.01 to 2.5 micrometers, that is 10 nanometers to 2,500 nanometers. The Maynard and Maynard study, similarly, did not measure particle size in the black smoke precisely, but inferred it. One of the first convincing set of animal studies showing the effect of particle size on toxicity was conducted by Oberdorster et al. using rats and mice. These graphs show the mass of titanium dioxide on the x-axis and the percent of neutrophils recruited, which is a measure of inflammation on the y-axis. Data for both rats and mice show that 20 nanometer particles have a greater toxic effect than 250 nanometer particles. In other words, for a given mass of titanium dioxide, the 20 nanometer particles have a greater toxic effect than the 250 nanometer particles. Next, Oberdorser et al. did something very interesting. They took the same data plotted in the previous slide and instead of particle mass on the x-axis, they plotted the surface area of those particles. When they did this, the data for both sizes of particles collapsed into one curve. It became obvious that the neutrophil response in the lung for both the ultrafine and fine titanium dioxide fitted the same dose response curve. This is a clear indication that the surface area of the particles is the more appropriate metric of exposure in this instance. A number of studies, as shown in the list at the top of this slide, have pointed out the better fit of dose-response relationships by expressing the dose as surface area rather than mass when describing toxicological effects of inhaled solid particles of different sizes. Many of the same adverse lung responses previously reported following inhalation of fibers or fine particles are being found with exposure to nanoparticles although often at much lower mass doses due to the increased total particle surface area per unit mass for nanoparticles compared to their fine sized analogs. Multi-walled carbon nanotubes and single-walled carbon nanotubes have been shown in several studies listed in the table at the bottom of this slide to be more potent on a mass basis. That is, a lower dose associated with a given adverse lung response or a greater adverse response at a given dose compared to ultrafine carbon black. Thus, the ultrafine carbon black study conducted by Elder et al. shows a no observed adverse effects level or NOEL at one milligram per cubic meter. 
In contrast, the studies for multi-wall carbon nanotubes, which is also elemental carbon, but in a nano size range, by Ma Hawk et al. and Paulun et al. show a no observed adverse effects level of 0.1 milligram per cubic meter. So what could be a good explanation for the increased biological activity of nanoparticles that is related to their surface area? One idea that we considered at the beginning of this module is the fraction of the atoms in a particle that is on the surface. For a one nanometer particle, around 50% of the particles are at its surface, while for a 10,000 nanometer or 10 micrometer particle, a very small fraction of its atoms are at the surface. This could be part of the explanation. However, not all of the studies agree with each other in their conclusions. There have been a few studies that contradict the basic message of the previous slides. A study by Says et al. shows that cytotoxic and inflammatory effects of titanium dioxide particles are independent of size and surface area of the particles. Warheit et al. indicate from their studies that the inflammatory effects of quartz, 12 to 500 nanometers in size, in rats are not correlated with size or surface area, but instead with surface reactivity. These studies seem to suggest a more complex picture that surface properties and not just surface area are crucial to eliciting health effects. Says et al. showed that biological activity depends largely on particle surface chemistry. The graph on the right shows the concentration of fullerene nanoparticles, or carbon-60, on the x-axis and biological activity on the y-axis. For water-soluble fullerene particles, the response increases with dose after reaching a threshold concentration. But as the surface of the fullerene molecules gets attached with more and more hydroxyl or carboxyl groups, the cytotoxicity decreases and the threshold also increases. Thus, surface derivatization decreases cytotoxicity of nanoparticles in this instance. Oberdorster et al. in another study looked at the toxicity of fresh and aged polytetrafluoroethylene or PTFE fumes on rats. Inhalation of fresh ultrafine PTFE particles with a count median diameter of 20 nanometers by rats for 15 minutes caused acute lung injury and high mortality within four hours after exposure to 50 micrograms per cubic meter concentration. In contrast, aging of the PTFE fumes for three to five minutes caused coagulation of the particles so that the count median diameter increases to around 130 nanometers as shown in this figure on the top right. The inflammatory response as measured by percent PMN is much reduced for aged PTFE exposure as shown in the figure on the bottom right. While some of the reduced toxicity might just be an effect of the larger particle size, the authors of this study suggest that it is likely that changes in particle surface chemistry during the aging period also contributed to this loss of toxicity. Now let us consider some studies on the effect of shape on toxicity. In this study, the mesothelial lining of the body cavity of mice were directly exposed to asbestos fibers as well as multiwall carbon nanotubes by intraperitoneal injection with a 50 microgram dose. The acute, that is 24 hour and seven day response was measured for these exposures. First, it is interesting to see the electron microscope images of the two types of particles and how similar they are in appearance. Second, the graph on the right hand side shows the lesion area for exposure to different types of particles. It is clear that short fibers of any kind are less toxic than long fibers. Thus, the lesion area for short fiber amocyte asbestos, denoted by SFA, is much less compared to that for long fiber amocyte asbestos, denoted by LFA. Most significantly, long, straight, multi-wall carbon nanotubes produce inflammatory response and formation of granuloma similar to long fiber amocyte asbestos fibers. 
Figure A on this slide shows a macrophage unable to engulf an amocyte asbestos particle because it is too long. Figure B shows a shorter amocyte asbestos particle being successfully engulfed by the macrophage and by phagocytosed. Long nanotubes are not phagocytosed by macrophages in figure C, while shorter ones are phagocytosed as shown in figure D. In the same way, as long amocyte asbestos fibers are not phagocytosed, while shorter fibers are. The fact that nanoparticles with the same chemical structure but different physical structure may cause different health effects poses a challenge for health risk assessment. For example, a substance such as nanoscale zinc oxide comes in a wide range of shapes as shown in this slide. Does this mean that a separate health risk assessment needs to be carried out for each type of zinc oxide? As we have also studied, shape is only one of several factors affecting toxicity besides particle size, surface area, surface derivatization, among others. These challenges to our understanding of the health risks of nanoparticles are yet to be completely understood and addressed. Besides particles with identical chemical properties but different physical properties causing different health effects, the same particle may cause a range of different categories of health effects. In addition to causing effects similar to mesothelioma, carbon nanotubes have also been shown to cause other effects in animal studies such as pulmonary granulomas, pulmonary fibrosis, genetic mutation, and carcinogenic potential, and cardiovascular effects. Again, these are all animal studies, and there is a lack of human epidemiological studies relating to the health effects of nanoparticles. Till now, we have studied the inhalation route of exposure and the health effects resulting from inhalation. The emerging picture seems complex, with a lot of parameters seeming to affect health risks. Now we will study the dermal effects of exposures to nanoparticles. The following topics will be addressed. The anatomy of the skin, factors affecting dermal penetration, studies on localization and migration of nanoparticles, dermal toxicity studies, and contradictory findings and the need for more research. The human skin performs a number of functions. It of course acts as a protective external barrier. It provides protection against dehydration, plays an important role in body temperature regulation. The nerve endings in the skin provide cutaneous sensation the skin also performs some metabolic functions such as vitamin D synthesis. It acts as a minor blood reservoir. And finally, it is also a route for excretion of toxins. The figure on the right shows a very simple diagram of the skin. The skin has three layers, the epidermis, dermis, and a fat layer, which is also called a subcutaneous layer, which is not shown in this figure. The epidermis is the relatively thin, tough, outer layer of the skin. Most of the cells in the epidermis are keratinocytes. They originate from cells in the deepest layer of the epidermis called the basal layer. New keratinocytes slowly migrate up toward the surface of the epidermis. Once the keratinocytes reach the skin surface, they are gradually shed and are replaced with newer cells pushed up from below. The outermost portion of the epidermis, known as the stratum corneum, is relatively waterproof and when undamaged, prevents most bacteria, viruses, and other foreign substances from entering the body. The epidermis, along with other layers of the skin, also protects the internal organs, muscles, nerves, and blood vessels against trauma. Scattered throughout the basal layer of the epidermis are cells called melanocytes, which produce the pigment melanin, one of the main contributors to skin color. Melanin's primary function is to filter out ultraviolet radiation from sunlight. The dermis, the skin's next layer, is a thick layer of fibrous and elastic tissue made mostly of collagen, elastin, and fibrillin that gives the skin its flexibility and strength. The dermis contains nerve endings, sweat glands, and sebaceous or oil glands, hair follicles, and blood vessels. 
The nerve endings sense pain, touch, pressure, and temperature. The sweat glands produce sweat in response to heat and stress. Sweat is composed of water, salt, and other chemicals. The sebaceous glands secrete sebum into hair follicles. Sebum is an oil that keeps the skin moist and soft and acts as a barrier against foreign substances. The hair follicles produce the various types of hair found throughout the body. Hair not only contributes to a person's appearance, but has a number of important physical roles, including regulating body temperature, providing protection from injury, and enhancing sensation. A portion of the follicle also contains stem cells capable of regrowing damaged epidermis. While in general, particles penetrate intact skin to a very small extent, several factors enhance penetration. Several studies have reported on dermal penetration of nanoparticles. In these studies, fluorescent beads were applied to human skin explant, which was then manipulated in a simulated flexing system. Particle penetration of the skin was found to be dependent on the extent and duration of flexing and particle size. Migration and encapsulation with connective tissue was also dependent on particle size. Tinkle et al. report some interesting findings on penetration of micrometer sized particles. In the figure on the left, four micrometer beads remain on the surface of the skin and do not penetrate. The middle figure shows that 0.5 and 1 micrometer beads penetrate the epidermis as a result of flexing the skin. The figure on the right shows enhanced penetration as a result of skin abrasion. Now we come to nanoparticle penetration of the skin surface. The photographs are from a study reported by Alvarez Roman et al. The figure on the top shows fluorescein 5 isothiocyanate or FITC deposited as a saturated solution is detected on the skin surface only. It does not penetrate the skin in solution form. But the same substance FITC in the form of nanoparticles localizes around the follicular openings, increasing in a time dependent manner. Follicular localization was favored by smaller particle sizes. Thus, while there is little evidence for penetration of intact skin, there are indications that nanoparticles preferentially localize around the openings of the follicles and could penetrate through them. What happens if the nanoparticles do penetrate through the epidermis into the dermis? A study by Kim et al. addresses this question. Nanoparticles in the form of quantum dots were administered directly into the dermis of the mouse, and their further migration was studied by a technique called near-infrared autofluorescence. The figure on the top right shows near-infrared autofluorescence before injection of the nanoparticles. And the figure on the bottom right shows autofluorescence five minutes after injection of the nanoparticles. We can see the silhouette of the mouse, and we can see autofluorescence in the area of the lymph node shown by the arrow. The nanoparticles have migrated to regional lymph nodes, raising potential concern for immunomodulation. Shvedova et al. studied the dermal effects of exposures to single-wall carbon nanotubes. The graph on the right shows that epithelial cells lose viability as they are exposed to higher levels of single-wall carbon nanotubes in in vitro studies. As I had mentioned earlier, transition metals are often used in the synthesis of carbon nanotubes. Unrefined single-walled carbon nanotubes often contain iron and nickel from catalysts. The presence of these metals can themselves lead to a decrease in the viability of epithelial cells. A metal chelator can reduce the loss of viability. Murray et al. demonstrated that purification of single wall carbon nanotubes can reduce toxicity. The figure on the right shows that the decrease in viability is less for more pure single wall carbon nanotubes. 
there are a number of factors influencing dermal penetration of nanoparticles, and our understanding is still very incomplete. Particle size, surface chemistry, the extent and duration of flexing seem to play a role in penetration. Different types of nanomaterials have different penetrations. For example, titanium dioxide and zinc oxide in sunscreen formulations remain on the skin surface. Dendrimers that are highly branched star-shaped macromolecules with nanometer scale dimensions with unique properties make them useful to the health and pharmaceutical industry. Penetration of these dendrimers are dependent on molecular size, geometry, and surface charge. Finally, penetration of lipid nanoparticles is influenced by size, lipid solubility, and surfactants. As in the case of inhalation exposure and its effects, there are contradictory reports in the literature regarding the effects of dermal exposure to nanoparticles. Some researchers, for example, Tan et al., have found size-dependent percutaneous absorption, while others, such as Mavon et al., have not. Similarly, Menzel et al. have found nanotitanium dioxide in the deeper epidermal layers, while other researchers, such as Kurtetz et al. and Kiss et al. have not. Contradictory claims have been made regarding nanosilver, nanogold, and also quantum dots. Thus, there is a need to do more research to better understand these issues. Is the skin a route of entry or a target organ? There is a shortage of data about many types of new compounds that needs to be addressed. The size, shape, coating, purity, presence of catalysts, extent of agglomeration are not well described in many studies. Studies should also account for anatomical exposure sites, the surface area, exposure time, chronic and repeated exposure, and the presence of skin diseases. Very little is understood about genotoxicity, cytotoxicity, and carcinogenicity of nanoparticles. At present, genotoxicity, cytotoxicity, and carcinogenicity is attributed to several factors. Direct interaction of nanoparticles with the genetic material, indirect damage due to reactive oxygen species generation, release of toxic ions from soluble engineered nanoparticles, interaction with cytoplasmic nuclear proteins, increased oxidative stress, and inhibition of antioxidant defense. Again, more research is needed to understand these mechanisms. One thing that researchers have realized is that while human health studies and epidemiological studies are the gold standard for health risk assessment, it may not be feasible to test the multitude of nanomaterials by this means. As we have seen, a nanomaterial with a single chemical structure can take on a multitude of physical forms, each with different health risks. Therefore, there is a need for rapid testing for risk evaluation and the development of in vitro assays that can predict in vivo responses. Donaldson et al. have found that in some cases, in vitro and in vivo dose response relationships for inflammation related responses correlate well. Similarly, Rushton et al. have found that in vitro cell assays for oxidative stress correlate well with in vivo rat acute lung responses. Zhang et al. have found a good correlation between in vitro and in vivo assays of oxidative stress and acute pulmonary responses. To summarize this module, inhalation is a significant route of exposure for nanoparticles. The small sizes of nanoparticles cause them to be translocated to regions of the body where larger particles cannot move to. The surface area and the surface properties of nanoparticles are more biologically relevant dose metric than mass. The toxicity of nanoparticles arises due to their small size, shape, and surface characteristics. While the dermal route is considered less important, 
it is also less well understood. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training, a METFAST program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, the National Institutes of Health, under award number R25ES023595. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health.